Years. Years of radio. The listening years. Years when CBS brought you the sound of history, of great events. Events made more vivid and unforgettable because when they happen, as they happen... CBS is there. Tonight for National Radio Week, CBS is there recreates actual broadcasts of notable events selected from the listening years. You will hear a president a prisoner, a king, and plain people speaking to you again as they spoke to you before in memorable microphone moments. And now, with John Daly as narrator... The Listening Years. CBS is there. You have waited three years, eight months, and 25 days for this moment. You have fought, worked, sacrificed, and prayed, and now it is here. Somewhere in the Pacific, it is happening 3,800 miles beyond Pearl Harbor, and you in Terre Haute, Okinawa, Berlin, and Birmingham, on ships at sea and down in mines, in crowded cities and RFD routes, you are there. Attention, peoples of the world. World War II is about to come to its official closing. We are on the Pacific Fleet flagship USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay for the signing of the surrender of Japan. We're on the veranda deck. Its great guns are pointed skyward to allow room for the Army, Navy, Marines, and the representatives of the nations who are here. Lieutenant General Jonathan Wainwright is here, he who surrendered at Corregidor, and Lieutenant General Arthur Percival, who surrendered at Singapore. With the Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces, General of the Army, Douglas MacArthur, and with him, the Admiral of the Fleet, Chester Nimitz, and other dignitaries. General MacArthur is now facing the microphone. I now invite the representatives of the Emperor of Japan to sign the instrument of surrender at the places indicated. Shigemitsu, foreign minister of the Japanese government, is stepping forward now. Shigemitsu, we see, has it's a wooden leg, apparently. He pulls the chair back. He's about to sit down. He takes off his silk top hat, pulling off his gloves, long yellow gloves. General MacArthur is waiting. He's looking down at Mr. Shigemitsu. Mr. Shigemitsu looks at his watch for some reason, consults some papers in his pocket. He's looking for a pen. He's got another watch. He's checking two watches. Well, at last he's got a pen out and he's preparing to do something, although he hasn't yet faced himself up to the surrender document. He's trying to get some ink out of the pen holder, which has no ink in it. Mr. Shigemitsu has some ink in his pen and he's ready to sign the document. It's a huge thing, about a foot and a half long by a foot wide. Printed up in beautiful gold type. I can almost read it from here. Mr. Shigemitsu is affixing his signature to the official surrender document. Here's another signature. Mr. Shigemitsu is doubly signing two documents here, of course. One copy for Japan, one copy for the Allies. Mr. Shigemitsu has signed the American copy. He's now signing the Japanese copy. I can almost watch him spell his name out. He's closing up his pen. Japan has surrendered, and there goes a flight of giant B-29s overhead. And now... September 1st, 1945... Japan surrenders unconditionally, and World War II is over. CBS is there. You're sitting with your ear practically glued to the horn of your loudspeaker. It's the very first time this has ever happened, before you've had to wait. You've always had to wait or catch the news off a ticker or go downtown and stand outside the newspaper office to see them chalk up bulletins. But now, now the annual moment, the traditional day of days for thoroughbreds at Churchill Downs, Kentucky is here, and you are there. They ought to be coming to the post soon for the 60-second running of the Great Kentucky Derby. Yes, here comes the parade to the post now. The band struck up the traditional theme song. I think you folks can recognize it. Now, here come the horses for the parade of this post. Spanish play is coming out first. Now, here's 20 grand. 20 grand, the big bay horse comes out of the track of the bound. Full of fire, full of fire. And there comes Mate with a dash and a jump. Going to be a hard battle ahead. Here are the others now as they take their post position. Here's how they line up now. Positions 1 to 12. Sweep all. Anchors away. The Mongol. Ladder. 20 grand. Spanish play. Boys, howdy. In eighth position is Surfboard, 20 grand stable mate. Ninth, Pittsburgher. Then mate, Vince Moore and Insco. They're, uh, they're all in the gate now. First time they've used the bar starting gate in the derby. 
Every horse is behaving like a thoroughbred. And they're off. They're off in a beautiful break. A beautiful break. Every entry clean out of his stall. And the Kentucky Derby is on. With Prince Demore right out there and cut from the start. So far, good clean race. No bumping, no crowding like we saw in the preachers last week. It's still Prince Demore with boys. Howdy and Ladder neck and neck right behind him. And the rest are pretty well bunched. There's 20 grand way back, way back. There's your first quarter now. And it's still Prince Demore, but he's dropping off fast as they take the clubhouse turn. And here comes Sweep All around on the outside. Sweep All with Mate right in there. Mate very well up in there. Battling Sweep All. And 20 grand is still behind the bunch. 20 grand next to last as they straighten out around the clubhouse turn. Pittsburgh trailing far behind all the others in this classic mile and a half run. And now they're leveling off for the back stretch. It looks bad for the Big Bay. It looks mighty bad if your heart's in there for 20 grand. He's got it. He's got a lot of courage. But going up there through a crowd of horses in the back stretch, that can take the fire out of the best of them. Now they're hammering down for the far turn. The ladder is out there driving to the lead. Sweet Ball dropping back a bit. Here comes Mate going right up after Sweet Ball and Ladder. And they're starting around the bend in that order. Ladder, Sweet Ball, and Mate in contention. And here comes the Thunderbolt. It's 20 grand. It's 20 grand driving in there, rushing up, rushing on through the field, through the whole field. It's 20 grand driving, driving seven. Six. He's in the clear behind the leaders. He's made it. He's cut through that field and he's hammering at the leaders now. There goes Ladder. Ladder can't stand the pace. Ladder's dropped off and it's Sweep Ball on top and Sweep right close behind. Now 20 grand ranging alongside. Right up there with Mate. And they're roaring past Sweep Ball now. A furlong and a half to go. Just a furlong and a half. And 20 grand and Mate are fighting it out in there. It's anybody's race. 20 grand's got the speed. But he's had to come from a way back. Don't forget that. And Mate's been going easy all the way. No. No, no. Mate couldn't take the grind. Mate dropping off. He's dropping, but here comes Sweep Ball again. It's Sweep Ball at 20 grand. And here they come down the home stretch. Here they come to finish, and it's 20 grand. Sweep Ball, Mate, it's 20 grand, 20 grand. All the way, it's 20 grand. May 16, 1931. The Kentucky Derby is broadcast for the first time. CBS is there. You are watching the last act of the greatest romance the modern world has known. How will it turn out? Will the king give up his empire or his love? He cannot have both. This is Antony and Cleopatra, Romeo and Juliet, Napoleon and Josephine. But this time... You don't have to wait for a Shakespeare or a Shaw to put it on a stage. This final curtain is real and now. And you, in kitchens and beauty parlors and soda fountains, you are there. This is Windsor Castle. His Royal Highness, Prince Edward. At long last, I am able to say a few words of my own. I have never wanted to withhold anything. But until now, it has not been constitutionally possible for me to speak. A few hours ago, I discharged my last duty as king and emperor. And now that I have been succeeded by my brother the Duke of York, my first word must be to declare my allegiance to him. This I do with all my heart. You all know the reason which has impelled me to renounce the throne. You must believe me when I tell you that I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do without the help and support of the woman I love. And I want you to know that the decision I have made has been mine and mine alone. This is the thing I had to judge. December 11th. 1936, King Edward VIII abdicates. CBS is there. You've put the kids to bed, 
And you and the missus are spending this quiet spring evening at home, reading, because it's too chilly to go out. She's reading the latest bestseller, Edna Ferber's Cimarron, and you're thumbing through a copy of the Literary Digest. Suddenly, you're bored. You put the magazine down and walk over to your super heterodyne and casually start twisting the dials, tuning from station to station, listening for something to listen to. For the moment is whether or not the firefighters can get into the burning wing right before me to unlock the two topmost tiers, cell blocks G and H. There are approximately uh, 150 men trapped in there. You better get in there fast or else those men inside are lost and their number will be added to the already ghastly total of about 200 prisoners already suffocated and burned to death and 300 injured in this terrible, terrible disaster. The scene around me is inferno. The prison yard is lit up by batteries of floodlights on the walls by the flames of the fire itself. Hundreds of men milling around here. Firemen, guards, soldiers from Fort Myers with bayoneted rifles. Nurses, doctors, priests, ministers, interns. All the convicts have been let out except those trapped up in this wing. Some of the convicts have escaped. One just walked out the front gate in all the confusion. Many of the prisoners are helping, carrying out dead and injured and laying them down on the lawn in front of the guardhouse. They're covered with tarpaulins, newspapers, blankets. It's a horrible scene. And now, here's a convict. Here's prisoner number X46812, a former preacher. Probably the best-known man in this prison, a lifer doing time for murder. I'm going to ask him to describe what's going on here in Columbus, Ohio, this awful night of April 21st, 1930. All right, go ahead. Go ahead, talk. My eyes is looking out on hell here tonight. When the fire came in my wing, there wasn't any time to pull my brethren out of the cells. We, we couldn't get the poor sinners out in time. Now... They're bringing them out now. They're, they're bringing my brethren out. My precious ones, the ones I've worked with, the ones I've prayed with, the ones I had to the night to miss all. They're bringing them out dead and dying like brands. What from... This is CBS in the Paramount Building in New York. Due to transmission difficulties, we've been forced to interrupt our dramatic broadcast from inside the walls of the Ohio State Penitentiary, where a fire is raging this night of April 21st, 1930. We're trying to... What? We have made contact with our CBS announcer again. So, over to Columbus. One of the prisoners here describing in his own words what's going on. The fire in this wing before me, the one in which the 150 prisoners are trapped in their locked cells, this fire is completely out of control. Firemen are pulling away. The walls begin to go. The roof. You can see the bars. You can see them. This is terrible. This is terrible. Nothing anybody can do. The wall. The wall. The wing has collapsed. It's down. All down. The men are lost. I've never seen anything like this before in my life. April 21st, 1930. The Ohio State Penitentiary burns. CBS is there. worried. There is a new frightening word. Depression. You're afraid you'll lose your job. Afraid your bank will fail. You're afraid they'll take away your house, your farm. It seems as though the country is crumbling. But out of the rain... This is preeminently the time to speak the truth. The whole truth. Frankly and boldly. Nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions in our country today. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive, and will prosper. So, first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, March 4th, 1933. The first inaugural. CBS is there. You are at peace, but the other side of the world is at war. You are a worker in the arsenal for democracy, a soldier in training, a parent dreading the inevitable. You search your very soul. You ask... 
What's all the shooting about? And you get the answer. In the future days, which we seek to make secure, we look forward to a world founded upon four essential human freedoms. The first is freedom of speech and expression everywhere in the world. The second is freedom of every person to worship God in his own way everywhere in the world. The third is freedom from want, which translated into world terms means economic understandings which will secure to every nation a healthy peacetime life for its inhabitants everywhere in the world. The fourth is freedom from fear, which translated into world terms means a worldwide reduction. January 6, 1941, a message to Congress. CBS is there. And now you are staggering from a cowardly attack. You're all fury and dedication to what lies ahead, and 140 million of you speak with one voice. I believe I interpret the will of the Congress and of the people when I assert that we will not only defend ourselves to the uttermost, but will make very certain that this form of treachery shall never endanger us again. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounded determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph. So help us, God. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, a state of war... December 8th. 1941, the war message. CBS is there. And now the guns are speaking, tearing apart the fabric of your life. Now you are at war. There are oceans between you and your son and father and brother. It's Christmas, but there are empty places at your holiday table, voices missing from the carols you long to hear. And radio is there to knit you and them so together this again. Broadcast of transatlantic call, people to people. There's time for just one more shortwave conversation today. Kenneth Collins, 14, a fine red-headed, freckle-faced American boy, wants to speak to his father in London. Is he there? There he is, right in front of me. Go ahead, Colonel Collins. Hello, Dad. <laughs> yes. Dad. My gracious. Your voice has dropped so about a whole octave. <laughs> well, almost. Uh, what are you now, the head of the family? Yes, just about. <laughs> well, uh, are you so big that you can wear all my clothes? Oh, yes. When you come home, there'll, there'll be just about one moth-eaten pair of trousers left. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Oh, my. I, I hoped you'd well, got so big that you couldn't wear them at all. Oh, I will be soon. <laughs> is your mother there? What's that, Dad? What? I, I say, is your mother there? Oh, she's out in the studio, and, and she stands all her love, and so does Sydney. Well, is she just as beautiful as the day I went away? Oh, yes. Then can you feel just the way I do? Uh, yes, Dad, I... Tell me, Kenny, how's the baby? Oh, she's fine. Did she pull over the Christmas tree yesterday? <laughs> no, not quite. Right. Uh, just about, though. Yes, you used to do that. I did? Oh, yes, yes, all the time. <laughs> uh, how's your behavior what? at school? What, Dad? Your behavior. How is your behavior? Oh, fine. Is it as good as mine was at your age? I hope so. Well, every generation is supposed to get a little better than the one before. Well, I couldn't be much better. Oh, oh, oh. Well, Kenny, our time's getting short. Oh, Dad, I guess... The you... uh, Scotch people here have a very, very lovely way of saying goodbye. Yes? Yes, they always say, God bless. I want to say God bless to you, to Mother, little Sydney... All your grandparents, and it comes from the bottom of my heart, son. Well, goodbye, Dad. And come home soon. I wish we didn't have to, but our transatlantic family reunion is just about over. Christmas, we go, 1943. Know. New York and London. CBS is there.
You know it has to come sometime. You know it must come. You know we have to start the road back to where they began because it will never be over unless we hit their own beachheads. And then while you're waiting, wondering when it will come, where it will come, it does come, and you are there. This is London. Under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces supported by strong air forces began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. This is London again. Actual recordings made across the channel during the invasion landings in the last few hours are beginning to come in from the war correspondents representing the combined American networks. We're going to play one of those recordings for you now. An actual recording, not a, a recreation. It was made at daybreak by George Hicks on an American warship off the coast of France under attack by Nazi planes. <laughs> Our own ship has just gave its warning whistles, and now the flak is coming up in the sky. Here we go again, another plane's come over. Right over our port side. Into the clouds before they burst. The plane is still going up, and now the plane is probably gone beyond. Looks like we're going to have a night tonight. Get a pair of eyes. Another one coming over. This is Robert Lewis speaking to you from the caucus room of the Senate office building in Washington. This is the second day of the reopened Hughes hearings. 
Committee Chairman Ferguson of Michigan is questioning an Air Force's official about the highly controversial F-11, the Hughes photo reconnaissance plane. The hearings, both yesterday and today, have been drab and dull compared to the wild scenes we saw in August when Howard Hughes, Johnny Meyer, and Elliot Roosevelt were in the witness chair. On the stand now is Brigadier General J.F. Phillips, wartime chief of the Materiel Division of the U.S. Army Air Forces. As we pick up the testimony by tape recording, Senator Ferguson is speaking to General Phillips. Did you discuss any men in public life about the plane? Oh, yes. Uh, Who? The, in, the, uh, in the history of the plane, uh, sometime, quite some time before that, there was a note from, uh, as I recall, signed FDR, what is there in, in this airplane? Not the F-11, that was the B-2, as I recall. Yeah, but the history of it. The and history of this plane. Well, did you discuss that with the group? I expect I mentioned that. Well, then it could have been that Riley... And so went the Hughes the investigation today here in Washington. There was more news at the United Nations. For that, here's Larry Lasser in New York. This is Larry Lasser. At the United Nations here at Lake Success today... Britain's Sir Harfley Shawcross speaks on the proposal for the so-called Little Assembly. Can one imagine Mr. Vashinsky getting up in court and addressing the tribunal and saying, Gentlemen of the jury, this prisoner is guilty. Evidence, don't let's bother about evidence. Uh, Pravda says he's guilty. Tass proclaims he's guilty. Documentary proof, gentlemen, this is a farce. I say he is guilty. He is flagrantly guilty. Off with his head. Off to Siberia. The chairman, Joseph Besh of Luxembourg, then recognizes the delegate of the Soviet Union, Andrei Vashinsky. His gray head bobbing up and down, Mr. Vashinsky vigorously declares his opposition to the formation of the so-called Little Assembly. I am listening to the English translation over my earphone. Mr. Vashinsky is comparing Mr. Shawcross to a snake. A snake which, he says, transfixes a rabbit with its magnetic eyes and says, Won't you let me embrace you? Then crushes the rabbit. But, says Mr. Vashinsky, Mr. Shawcross has miscalculated. Mr. Shawcross does not have the magnetic eyes of a boa constrictor, and Russia is not a rabbit. And so the international debate goes on another day in the United Nations. CBS is there today, tomorrow, always. November 6th, 1947. The United Nations. CBS is there. You have heard the listening years. A special broadcast in the series, CBS is there, produced and directed by Robert Louis Cheon. The listening years was written by Alan E. Sloan and was presented for National Radio Week. We hope it served to remind you that CBS is there means you are there not only imaginatively at great events of the past, but also you are there in fact, as CBS this week and every week brings you its real up-to-the-minute coverage of history in the making. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.